How's it going, everybody? My name is Kirby Downey, and I'm going to be talking about designing for 3D printing. I hope everybody is enjoying the SolidWorks largest user group meeting ever, or SlugMe6. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this and being asked to, to present here. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying it out there. Uh, put a one in the chat if you're, you're having a good time. If, uh, if you've enjoyed the presentations before, uh, before this, or if you, you're looking forward to learning more about designing and 3D printing, or if you like to be told what a recording tells you to do. We'll get straight into the presentation then. So, like I said, I'm going to be talking to you about designing for 3D printing. Um, I pressed the wrong button. There we go. Um, what I'm going to be showing you today is about me, tell you about a little bit about me, why um, I feel like I'm the right person to talk about this. Um, some of the 3D printing technologies that exist out there, um, the most common ones. Some design considerations. Uh, these are a couple of things that I've always used to, I, I always think about when I'm designing something. And some tips and tricks within SolidWorks to uh, just improve a bit of your workflow. So, straight into about me. I'm uh, Kirby Downey. I'm originally from South Africa, currently live in London. Um, and I've worked with 3D printers since 2009, which is a very long time. I, I remember the first time I saw a 3D printer, and this gave me the idea of, I can actually do anything with this. Everybody else that was around me at university at that point looked at a 3D printer and, you know, they thought I could just, you know, oh, I can make my designs for this. My mind was blown and I thought I can do anything. And that's exactly what I did. Um, so I'm a big nerd. I enjoy video games. I enjoy Star Wars, film, you know, all that, all that usual stuff that nerd people enjoy. I enjoy that too. And that went very well with this idea of, the ability to produce anything that I wanted. We've all been there. You know, your first day into SolidWorks, you make a square. Maybe put a fillet on it, but generally you make a block. Um, and after a uh, quite a bit of practice, you start to experiment and you start to push the, the boundaries of what you're capable of and you can do some crazy, crazy stuff in the technologies. Same thing to do with with 3D printing. You know, you look at a 3D printer straight off the bat and you start to, you know, print the normal stuff of Thingiverse, Mimely Factory, um, or very simple stuff. But then um, as you get more versed with your machine, get more comfortable with it, uh, you, you start to push the boundaries of your machine um, and you start to do some crazy stuff. So the first question is, why would you want to 3D print your parts? First one is the most common one, and that is prototyping. That's where 3D printing kind of started, rapid prototyping. A quick way to get something in your hand so that you can hold it, see its size, feel uh, feel out the shape of it, um, all that kind of stuff. So prototyping is your first go-to for 3D printing. Um, model making, it's quite popular with that as well. You know, if you want to make a prop or you want to make a, a replica of a building, um, 3D printing is your... Um, best tool for very detailed parts, parts that would take you much longer to create by hand. Um, you can test mechanisms and, and fittings. You know, if you're making this big model and you need to figure out how you're going to fit it together, um, if you just have, if you just test out the little fittings and trial them out, that way you don't need to print this massive thing and then they don't clip together. I've been there. Trust me, you don't want to do that. So test them out. Um, you can even look at doing small batch production. Um, if if you're looking to uh, as as a startup business or you, you're looking to produce a new product, but you, you don't want to tool out create a tool for fifty of them, you know that's a very expensive tool for fifty items. Um, so you can do these small batch productions with uh, zero in investment in tooling. Um, you can do a faster turnaround time. So for example, if you want to get your product out next week, put it on a printer and you got your your products out there already. Um, you don't need to wait for it to go to a factory, then to tool out your your the, the tools and prepare everything, manufacture it and bring it to you. You can just uh, get it done. Um, you you can do. You can even have faster changes to your design. So, for example, if if your design requires you to be um, showcasing the latest um, Marvel movie or the latest video game, you know whatever is the trend at the moment. Um, and the face of your product has that on there. Um, we all know that these trends change very quickly. 
So if you need to have a certain logo on there one month and the next month a different logo because there's a different reason for it, uh, the, tra the trends have changed, a new mini series is out or something like that. Um, you can just quickly change your design, but you don't need to change the tool. You just change your design, pop it on the printer and you've got your new version of it. Um, I've also spoken about zero tooling costs as, uh, as well. Um, you don't need to pay for any tooling costs. You All you do is pay for your, your filament or um, if you go to a bureau, you just literally pay for what you're getting. Um, you don't have to invest any big money into it. And then the last reason, and my favorite reason, is because you can. You know, if, if you've got a 3D printer that's not doing anything and you want to do something, you, you want to make something that's just sitting in your mind, you want to bring it to life, just print it. You know, um, having the ability to do whatever you, you know, produce whatever you want in your own home um, is an incredible piece of technology and being able to just produce what you want um, whenever you want. So a couple of things I've 3D printed. Um, like I said, I've worked with 3D printers since 2009 back in university. Um, and I've worked uh, quite a, across quite a wide variety of different machines and technologies. But we'll get into those technologies in a little bit. So, ooh, that's a terrible screenshot. I should need, I, I need to update that. Uh, but I will show you this model in a little bit. Um, but this is an AT-80 um, from Star Wars, and I wanted to make a cutout model of it um, and a replica, which I then 3D printed. Um, all of that is fully articulated. I've got little bits over here that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, but that's the AT-80 that I 3D printed. Again, like, I wanted to make a 3D printed model of an AT-80. Um, as a kid, I always wanted a toy of a big AT-80 to play with. Um, but they, they were very chunky, and this was a bit more accurate, and it's got the detail sections in as well, um, just to add a bit of extra, you know, something to it. Um, this is a very simple project that I did. Um, this is just a little arcade Nintendo box that you can just uh, uh, slide your little switch in there um, and you can play it like it was an arcade. Um, very, very simple project. But again, it's just something that I, I saw something similar to this online. I was like, let me see if I can make that myself. Let me challenge myself and, uh, and do that. And I use SolarWorks to produce that. Here's another prop that I did. This was a commission for Bethesda. For the Doom 2016 release, um, they asked me to uh, produce the BFG for them and 3D print it, life size. Um, that was a big prop, um, one of the biggest props that I created. Um, and that was something to do for the release of Doom for Bethesda in the UK. Um, I wish we had a bit more time to work on this to finish off all those seams, but we did run out of time. But um, something that's, that's a little proud for me, but that actually ended up on the... Um, Guinness World Records as the heaviest 3D printed uh, video game prop and you can see my name is right there Boom. That was a fun project But I've printed a lot of things and a lot of the things that I've printed are really 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 big um, One example is here is I wanted to print the sword out um, and not have any uh, not have any like reinforcements and no glue um, so I Created this funny little zigzag thing to snap them all together and that that whole thing is attached with no glue um, It's not the best way to, to create something but it was an, it was a challenge each one of these projects um, forced me to step out of my comfort zone and push the limits of the technology and my skills in SolidWorks where I'm currently working now is a company called 3d print UK we are a service bureau um, specializing in SLS and HP MJF uh, 3d printing um, this is where I do a lot of like batch production work <clears throat> So let me go into the different technologies. There, there are more technologies than this, but this is the three most common ones. And these are the three that I've worked on. I didn't want to talk about a technology that I uh, had never worked with before. Sorry, I was just checking my timing. I, I decided I'm not going to cut and chop this out. All of the little bits like this, I'm, I'm keeping them because they're fun. Makes it more like it's a live thing. Again, if everybody in the chat's having a great time, put a one into that chat. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about FDM, um, filament. This is the most common type of 3D printing that exists out there. This is what you see on the, the news and TV and all the time. It's these type of machines. <clears throat> so you, you got your Prusas, your Prusa styles, you got your larger Stratasys and your Ultimakers, you know, quite a wide variety of different machines, but essentially they do exactly the same thing. 
They use a plastic wire as their material. And that goes through to, like, if you would imagine a hot glue gun trapped to a CNC head so that that hot glue gun, is, you know, got this wire pushing through it. Let me switch to that. you got this wire pushing through it into this hot end and forcing it to come out. And then you've got that CNC head that precisionly places where that material should be. That is, you know, a very easy way to explain what FDM 3D printing is. Um, this this form of technology can be very, very clean. You can see this really cool farm here on the right-hand side uh, with a bunch of prusas, and it's fairly clean. They've got a little bin with all their fails and that. On the left, that's my own little setup that I have up behind me there. I've got a few little fails over there. <clears throat> um, but that's not going to stain my table. That's not going to make a mess. You know, these little bits of filament over here, they're not messing the floor. Sweep it up and, you know, you've, you've cleaned it up quite nicely. Um, so it's, it's quite a, a clean process. Uh, it's something that can be done, you know, in your office, right, on, on your desk next to you. One of the disadvantages of uh, FDM printing is that you're going to need support material. On the right-hand side, we got that at, at foot. On the left, you know, the support worked out beautifully, and that worked out nicely. On the right-hand side, that support there failed, um, causing the filament to sag. And on the left here, you can see I've still got a bit of uh, support in there, which needs to be removed. So there is a post-process required if you are doing any supports. But I will get into how you can avoid having supports. Um, this little... A little bit of bubbly here. That's just me tuning my printer at the same time. Um, but it's also a very good example of, you know, where support worked and where support didn't. So you're going to need support material. That's one thing you're going to have to keep in mind. You're going to see your layers with FDM. You can reduce your layers quite a bit on FDM. I think this is about 0.2 mil. I never go below 0.2 mil because as soon as you go to 0.1 mil, you're going to get almost the same thing and it's going to double your time. And surfaces like this top flat surface and on top of these feet, it's going to be very difficult to remove those layers uh, because they're quite uh, a low angle to the bed. Um, so you've got to be wary about your visible layers and where you want them, and you've got to try and orientate to compensate for that. Um, and one of the best things about FDM 3D printing is that there is a lot of online support. This picture here of this little boat, this is called the Benchy. Um, it is the benchmark model. This is the standard model that almost every person in 3D printing has printed at least once in their life. On the left there, that is um, Daniel Noré, uh, the creator of the 3D Benchy. But for example, if you know, you, you're know having problems with your 3D printer, print yourself a Benchy, whether it's your own kind of benchmark that you that allows you to see um, the, the problems that you're trying to avoid on your printer, or you just use the Benchy. Um, print it out, take a photo, and put on a lot of these Facebook and, and Reddit groups, and very quickly people can start to diagnose your issues. For example, this saggy little bit over here, um, what that basically means is the, the cooling fan isn't cooling enough and uh, it's getting way too hot and causing too much sag. And over here, you're having retraction problems, which basically means that the material is pulling out and pulling back in. Uh, too far and it's not extruding properly um, so retraction settings need to be changed here and back up here again with your there's too much heat uh, the cooling fan is not working because that nozzle is working so much in that tiny little area that it's actually melting the plastic and it's not cooling so that's a good example of you know a really bad print um, and that you can get that sorted out by using a lot of online support so you'll never feel lost with this technology you'll never feel like um, there's a problem and you need to wait for an engineer to get it you get it sorted out um, you can fix a lot of these problems on your own the fdm technology has a very cheap entry point and that's what makes it extremely popular ones like the two on the left they're, they're about your 200 us dollar mark um, the one on your right that's a prusa original prusa um, they're about your 700 dollar us mark um, so for someone who just wants to print stuff and play around and print what they want, it's a very, very cheap entry point over there. Um, you can go for your higher end machines such as your Raise 3D Ultimaker all the way up to your Stratasys um, machines. Um, and they, they offer a bit more support um, and you can do a lot more with these machines 
um, in terms of materials and um, the quality of your parts. Um, you, you pay for a better service, essentially. Um, but in the core, they do the same thing. They extrude hot filament out of a nozzle that's controlled by CNC head and creates plastic parts. So let's get into DLP and SLA. This is uh, the kind of technology that uses your resins. So your DLP and resin machines look something like this. They're very space agey and very futuristic type of look to it. I really like the look of these type of printers. Um, so your SLA um, resin 3D printers, they use lasers, which is quite cool. The way this technology will work is this is your your uh, your print bed, and that will move down into a vat of resin. A laser will just go pew 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 pew, pew and um, basically outline and draw um, the profile that you're trying to produce. Um, and this is a UV laser, and it cures the resin, which is UV photosensitive. Um, I think that's the right term. Um, but basically, that UV light will then cure the resin and will cure it to the part below it. That part will then move out of the resin. The resin will then flow back into where the part was and it'll go back down. And the laser will do the exact same thing. Pew, 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 outline the next profile layer um, and so on and so forth. Um, very, very kind of simple technology. All you need is a motor over there and a motor over there. The more popular one, the DLP, I say popular, but it's the cheaper entry point for this is a DLP. This is where it uses a projector um, or an LCD screen to project the profile onto the resin um, instead of a laser. This is really, really cool because all it has to do is show a single image of the profile and that cures that whole area. It doesn't need to outline and draw anything. This is a much faster way of producing, but it does exactly the same thing. The bed lifts up and down, up and down, up and down between layers to ensure that the, the resin can flow between the part and the and the FEP sheet. Um, and the projector will produce the, the image and that will then create your part. You can get a very, very high level of detail with resins. As you can see, this exact same part have you seen before, the 8080 foot. You can see how much sharper and crisper all this detail is. Um, for that so if you, if you want something that's quick just to see the size FDM is perfect for you but if you want something that's high detail something that you want to show something you, you want to show someone you want to present this to a client your resin's a much better deal for that because you can get much higher quality detail out of that you can also print in clear um, this little yellow model that's how the clear resin comes out but a lot of elbow grease because it's solid you can actually uh, polish it really smooth and, and make it clear. Um, this is a model done by Evil Dan Makes on, on Instagram. Um, a very, very good example of how much a lot of elbow grease can get really, really cool resin models. You can have much faster print times. Uh, these faster print times come down to a DLP machine. Remember I said that that DLP machine will just project the image of the profile needed? Well, that means is that if you duplicate that same image over and over, it just still only shows one image per layer and it cures it. If this was an SLA machine, um, that laser will be doing a lot of hard work outlining and drawing everything out, where this just shows an a single image and you get the exact same amount of parts out in the exact same amount of time. One of the main downfalls um, and something that you've got to get really used to it is with even SLA and DLP is it needs custom supports. Um, you, with the resin flowing and, and a lot of moving fluids, um, as well as, you know, things need support. You need to place supports very, very strategically, like I have outlining the areas. Uh, you can see these little areas that have straight lines, but everything else is scattered around. And that's to make sure that the part doesn't float in the resin once it's been... Um, once that bit of resin has been cured, it doesn't float or stick to the bottom, um, which can cause very, very big problems. So, you know, every single one of these supports were custom placed by me. You can do auto supports, but they're not as reliable. And you learn this very quickly. Um, in order to get the very, you know, in order to get this flat face here, I needed 
tons and tons and tons of support in this. Um, and that took me quite some time to actually do. And that sat on there just like that. So you got to put that into account as well. You're going to need a lot of support material. Hopefully one day the auto generation of supports will be better. I know the more higher end machines, they do have much better auto gen support um, models out there. Um, but I prefer to place them by hand because and I know um, because I know everything about this model. I know where all the little parts that are most important. Resins are messy. Unlike FDM, where if a bit of filament goes on the side, you don't need to, you know, you just sweep it up and put it away. Um, where resin, you know, resin is very toxic. Um, it's bad for your skin. You don't want to breathe it in. You even need to wash in IPA. You, you got to wash your model in IPA um, tubs, tubs full of IPA alcohol, um, which again, you don't want to breathe in. You don't want to be around that stuff too, for too long. So this is not something that you can have on your desk very easily. Um, you need a workshop or a space to be able to do this, a well-ventilated space. And if you do have a catastrophic fail uh, where resin gets inside the machine or resin gets all over the place, it's very difficult to clean up. Um, it's really not a nice uh, material to work with, but it does produce the really good parts. So you've got to find that balance of what you're willing to deal with. Recently, these machines have allowed a much cheaper entry point with the Elgo Mars and the Voxer Lab type of printers, around $100 to $200 US. But you get your more expensive form labs um, all the way up to your big industrial machines. Um, but with those, you're getting better quality and you're getting much bigger print volumes um, with those type of machines. And the last technology I'm going to speak about tonight is SLS and MGF, powder-based 3D printing. So these are the type of machines that would use that form of, uh, we use powder. They're very big machines, um, not the kind of machines that you'll see in your home uh, very soon. This works very similar to DLP. I lie. This works very similar to SLA, um, where you have the laser that outlines and draws in the powdered plastic. The bed will move down. A roller will come across here and bring a bit more powder across the bed. And that laser will pew 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 into that powder again. But the laser will actually penetrate about two, three layers deep. And that actually fuses the lasers together. With FDM, your layers are only kind of placing on top of each other, using heat to adhere each other to each other. But you're still only putting a layer on top of a layer. Where this, you're fusing them together. MJF is a technology um, produced by HP, um, something new that we've been playing around with work. Um, this is similar to DLP, where powder gets laid down onto your bed. A massive big print head will come across and print down the image of the profile in it using a fusing agent and a detailing agent. And um, then some energy using fusing lamps will then fuse that all together and make a solid model and fuse that down to the previous layers as well. So similar to DLP, where just uh, the entire layer, it takes the same amount of time to do one layer. If you've got one part or if you've got a thousand parts. You can achieve a very high detail with this, um, as you can see with these parts. Not as much crisp detail as your uh, resins, but you can still get very high details with this technology. Um, and you can make injection mold like parts. I mean, these parts on the right hand side, they look injection molded. Um, if, if I had never said anything, spoke about 3d printing you could have easily fallen for that being a, a, an injection molded part you know at, at work we describe these as near injection mold like um, because they they almost can be used as final products the most beautiful thing about this is that there is no support required these are the type of builds that we produce um, everything is self sus self suspended in the powder which means you do not need to worry about any supports. You can create any damn shape you want. It doesn't need support. You can also nest parts within other parts. Some uh, 3D printing bureaus will um, charge by a bounding box, you know, where they, if your part would fit in a box, how big would that XYZ of that box be? But what that does mean is that there's a lot of space in here that you're paying for, um, which means that you can put other parts there and that makes it cheaper. There's a little secret for you. Um, but 
check with the bureau that you want to do SLS 3D printing with, experiment, upload these parts individually, see if they work out cheaper as that, or if they work out cheaper um, like this. It depends on your bureau. bureau. Some of them will charge for your volume um, and some will be bounding box. This is one of the main reasons why I don't see this type of technology getting into a law office or getting into your homes. It is very, very messy. You can see this is quite a, a, a messy room. This is where we do all of our depowdering, get rid of the powder from the parts. Um, you can see this powder just gets everywhere and you need a proper extraction system. But I'll get into that in a minute. These are very, very expensive machines. Because not only do you need to buy the machine, you need to buy the breakdown station. You need to buy the ATEX rated uh, Hoover because powder can cause uh, dust explosions. It's, it's actually quite dangerous to work with if there's a lot of static. You've got to have an ATEX rated extraction system um, as well as all the other peripherals needed to be able to produce plastic parts. Um, it's, not a, it's not a cheap entry point for 3D printing. And you get optional extras for cleaning and surfacing and coloring. Other than that, you've got to scrape powder off those parts manually, and that's a lot of work. I've done that for eight hours a day when I first started working with SLS printers. It's not fun having machines like these make it better, and your bureaus will have these, and they get a much better consistent surface finish. So let me jump into some design considerations. These are little things that I think of in the back of my head, um, and I'm going to show some cool SOLIDWORKS models in line with this. You've got to be mindful of your overhangs. Any overhang you have is going to require support material unless you have a 45 degree chamfer in there. So how does this work? Well, anything and the rule of thumb, you can do 60 degrees um, with, with the model going there, but the rule of thumb is 45 degrees. 45 degrees to the bed, anything less than that, you're going to need support. That's your red zone. Anything more than 45 degrees doesn't need support. So if you've got a section that's got a massive big square in there with a 90 degree, Put a chamfer on there and you won't need any support. So that's the thing you've got to think about um, when designing things is will these little areas need support? So I spoke about the support required for these parts here, but I'm going to show you a awesome little 3D model um, that I created in SolidWorks. Um, which had, had uh, which which made me have to really think about support materials in a different way. So let me hide that part there. So this is the front end of a sleeper simulant from the video game Destiny. I really wanted to model this because this challenged me with a lot of triangles and different angles. So if you look at the rule that I just explained, and I just realized I'm not sharing my screen, there it is. So here's a sleeper simulant. This was a cool model that forced me to really push my, my limits in 3D modeling and really experiment with new techniques, such as you know, putting these, these kind of off-angled parts in, in weird areas. And um, yeah, it was a real challenge to model this and the fact that I had no reference images. But this is how I was going to print it. You know, nice flat face for my FDM printer, nice 45 degree angles, nothing really needs support other than that face over there. But here's my first issue. This face here is 45 degrees to the bed. So that face isn't going to need support, nor is that face, and nor is this face. But this piece is floating in the air. There's an island here. I need to be able to print this. I need to get supports on this. Um, but it's the, the slicing software is going to think, ah, nah, you don't need supports there, mate. Don't need it. So... Option one, change the angle of, of supports that you can do in your slice until it you know, puts supports on anything um, above 45 degrees. What's going to happen there is I'm going to get supports all inside here, and that will just be such a pain to remove. So my other option was, boom, custom supports. So I built this little block here, made it 0 0.5 mil away from the actual body here, and then allowed it to be um, support-free. Didn't have to put any support on this model um, and still self-support itself. And then that just popped off and, you know, problem solved. So you got to be careful with uh, support sometimes because sometimes it'll catch you out. But something do, doing some custom supports like these, um, like on that um, 
80, 80 foot, I had to do those custom supports there um, and kind of work it out and, and figure out how am I going to make this look really, really good. The next thing we've got to look at is holes. Um, same rule with the 45, you know, a circle when it gets to the top, that's the angle is getting a bit higher than 45 degrees to the bed. So you're going to need, so, so it's going to sag just like that picture over there. Is one option you know small holes you should be fine you can just drill a hole in it and that will clear it up or if you've got a very long channel and a long hole and you don't want to put supports in there put a triangle on the top of that circle do some custom supports just like that on the right triangle works the best though i find so that's a very good little tip there when you're doing holes you can get away with variable wall thickness and that's really really exciting because if you're doing something that's injection molded, you're very limited to your, you know, you've got to keep everything uniform in terms of wall thickness. So let's show you this 3D inject this three in this injection injection molded part that I've created. So as you can see, this part's got its ribs. Everything is a uniform wall thickness. Everything's around the same, just to avoid any putting on this nice surface. Standard part, we've all seen something like this somewhere or other, or we've had to work on a part like this. But if you were to 3D print your part, like this one, you don't need to worry about hollowing out this cavity and putting ribs for strength in order to keep a uniform body. You can have a massive thick part with a really thin section as well, um, and it won't affect any, any of the strength and it won't affect any pitting or anything like that because of the process. So you can start to really experiment with uh, your, your parts and, and not have to be bound by the fact that you need to have a two mil wall thickness throughout the whole entire thing. Um, you can really push the limits of your part from there. Oops. There it is. Uh, next one to look at is hollowing parts out. So sometimes if you've got something really, really big, hollowing it out can save a lot of space and save a lot of material. So this is a section from a prop that I was working on many, many years ago called the Thunderlord, also from Destiny. So this is a section from a very, very long prop. Um, so if you're taking this to a convention, you want to make it light. You want to make it easy to carry. And you also want to save some material and time sometimes. So what I've done, instead of making this completely solid, I've hollowed it out. And you can see I've even got variable wall thickness. I've got a, you know quite a thick little chunk over there, different chunk over there. You know, it's not uniform thickness. I've also added in some little 45 degree areas here so that the, those don't need any support. But this is all hollowed out in order to save material and save time and make it easier to attach and easier to carry for whoever wants to print one of these out. Um, so that's something you can do with your parts as well. Um, think about, you know, you don't need that big chunky little bit in the middle. Hollow it out. If you haven't hollowed it out, you're going to have a thing called infill. Um, this is the fill inside the body. Um, this, you know, it, it was basically either square or honeycomb structure. There's a bunch of different ones, and I'll show that in a minute. Uh, but this allows the inside of the body to be strong but hollow at the same time. You know, you can, you know, I, you can go quite high, almost to 100 percent. But I always find above 40%, you're, you're just wasting time and material. You're going to have almost the same amount of strength in there. And if you want even extra strength, you can always increase your wall thicknesses. Um, I'm usually at the 10, 12, 15, 10% type of area. But this is what the inside of a, an FDM 3D part, part will look like. And these are kind of different um, info patterns that you can achieve with this. But if you can start really experimenting here so say for example you make a square and then you 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 choose a very fancy 3d infill you just tell your printer don't print the outside walls and suddenly you've got the square shaped organic looking part so take this idea and think about making this really cool organic round part print it without any um outer walls only keep your infill and you just have this really cool interesting shape you can even play around with lighting like i did with this part yeah i put some lighting inside and uh, that's when i noticed that info actually shows through with light 
So you can actually even play around with lighting and these interesting infill patterns. Chamfers versus fillets. We either love the one or we hate the other one. Um, either or, they're the best fe one of the best features in SolidWorks, I find, because that's what finishes your model. So this is what happens if you just put a fillet on a part um, and 3D print it with no support. Same thing with your holes. You know, you're gonna you're getting a, a section that's um, closer to the bed than it should be, and you're gonna need support in that section. If you don't put that support, it's gonna sag and not look as nice. If you don't want to have a little bit of support on here and you have to break it off all, all the time, use a chamfer. Chamfer is also very good because if you put a little one more chamfer on your pot that's facing on the bed, you can just slide a spatula underneath there really, really easy and actually clear your pot and remove it off the bed very, very easily. You can also do some print in place stuff and there's very, very interesting stuff you can do with this. So this is my original at model. Minus the interior. Don't know where it disappeared to. I, th I need to find the final model. This is my AT80 model that I created, and I wanted a lot of articulation with this part. I've done it again. Here is my AT80 model. <laughs> um, I wanted a lot of articulation with this, um, and a lot of movement. And if you look at these feet, each feet, each foot has eight. My maths. Each foot has four toes. Um, and each of these toes I wanted to move around. But that would mean that for each foot, that would be five parts to print. So I needed to figure out how I'm going to make the, this part, these toes move around without having to assemble them. So let's bring out the foot, and I'm going to section it. As you can see in the section, it's actually attached with this rod, which is quite cool. And that means that that's stuck in place. That's what I call print in place. Um, and it means that when your part comes off the bed, all you need to do is just kind of loosen it. Your little toes will move. Yeah. So you can print a model that's already assembled and you don't need to assemble anything. You know, suddenly... You can eliminate so many hours as part of your assembly process by not having to assemble anything but printing in place. Um, and I've, I find that very, very fascinating and a very interesting concept um, in terms of, you know, you, you, you can cut down so many costs and you, you don't need to worry about um, assembly anymore. Another model I'll show you is called my spinning cube, which is this bad boy over here. Um, no, I couldn't find the original model of this, so I had to find the old step file. But this is a concept that I had. I had a cube that I was spinning around. I was like, I need to make a model of this, but how do I print on a corner? Same issue came when I didn't have, you know, all these faces didn't need support, but I needed to support it. So I created these custom supports. Um, and when it comes off the printer, it just spins in place. Very fun little toy, also print in place. Um, but that's that's the kind of, you know, you, you take this idea and you, you run with it, you can really do interesting things. You want to check out your tolerances as well. Um, every, 3D printers are like cars. Um, you and your mate can buy the exact same car brand new. Um, your mate's car could break down in the next six months because he's driven it fast and hard and didn't look after it, but yours, yours lasts for 10 years. Exact same car came off the same factory floor, but, you know, two different outcomes. Depending how you look after your machine and depending on what your machine is capable of, um, you'll be able to push the limits even further. So making a tolerance guide like this, or you can even download them. There's tons of them online already. If you get one of these little tolerance guides, what you can then do is print this out, um, this has a spacing of 0 0.15 mil all the way to 0.5 mil. And you can just pull on these levers and see, oh, that's a bit loose. That's great for a nice loose fitting and come around here and see it's, oh, it's quite tight. You can maybe do some interference fits with that kind of tolerances. But this allows you to understand your machine. If you have multiple machines, um, it's good to know what each machine is capable of. Um, so you can take full advantage of it. Threads are asked for a lot. People always ask, should I 3D print my threads? Um, 
quickest and easiest answer is no, don't. Um, do kind of what the injection molding industry does and use um, inserts, threaded inserts that are melted into the plastic or use self-tapping screws or even use captive nuts, little areas where you can stick a nut in and you can screw it in. Only time I'd regularly say, you know, threads are okay to do if you're doing really large oversized threads. But tiny threads are very, very quickly lost in the layers. Um, and it, the plastic is can be quite soft that you're just going to strip that, that screw thread very, very quickly. So I wouldn't recommend screw threads at all. So just like with any kind of technology, you want to design for your manufacturing process. You want to design for that technology. You, you want to first choose your technology, whether it's injection molding or vacuum forming, roto molding, uh, any form of manufacturing process. You choose that technology first. Design for that technology and take full advantage of that technology's benefits. Um, and that will allow you to push the limits of your parts. You know, once you understand what you can get away with, with these technologies, then you can really push the limits. So I'm going to fire through a couple of really quick tips. And I'm going to remember to switch to SolarWorks this time. Don't you worry about that one. Um, I haven't forgotten. So save a single STL as a, in a multi-body part. So I'm going to show you the bo helmet model that I made a few months back for Brad Thompson of Impact Props. Nope, we don't want to open the STL. We want to open the 3D model. So let's get rid of this body. Yeah, let's delete that. So here we got the bo helmet. This was another one of those things. I saw bo helmet on the Mandalorian series and I was like... I need to make that. Um, it was just proved a really cool challenge to to create these these soft surface curves and um, these cuts within it, and just creating these shapes. Um, it was a very very fun project for me to undertake because it was pushing my limits, and I'd never made a helmet before as well. Exciting, but I designed this so that the main dome can be three D printed on FDM, and these side little pieces can be printed in SLA. Because I know this will be quicker in FDM and very large surfaces can be sanded very nicely. Whereas these little bits can come out very nicely in resin. So say for example I want to test print this little piece here on its own. I've done it again. Whoops. <laughs> so here's the bo helmet. As I was saying, these are the curves faces that I really wanted to challenge myself on um, and then you know and really experiment with these cheeks uh, shapes inside them and the dome here that's what was printed in FDM and all these little side greebly bits were printed in resin so say you want to save just the single part it's two options you can either go insert features delete body and you can delete all of these bodies that you don't want. And you're left with that. And you can file save SDL. Easy peasy. Problem is when you want to sign you don't want to save a different piece, you then got to go into this feature. And edit it. And change the piece that you want to get rid of. I press the rec. But you, you see what I mean, you know, you, you, you've, there's a lot of steps required in order to save one part. But I very quickly, well, I'll say very quickly, I wish I learned it very quickly. Um, if you go to File, Save As, let me click on it first. You're going to click on the part that you want to save first. You then go to File, Save As, select the format. We're going to go for STL. We're going to say Save. I'm going to save it as normal res because we're going to need that in a minute. I'm going to save that. Yes, we want to replace it. That's okay. So it's going to show everything, all the parts in uh, STL format. This one STL basically looks like a bunch of triangles. Um, 22,000 triangles to be exact. So we're going to say, yes, I'm happy with how this looks. It's then going to pop up with this export box. And this allows me to save all bodies, which will save everything. Selected faces, the face that I had selected, all selected bodies. 
if I click selected bodies, all it's going to do is save that single body as an STL, which is there. So that's a, that's a fun, easy way to save. You know, if you've got a lot of bodies, and you can do this with assemblies as well, if you've got a lot of bodies and you just want to save that little piece, click on it, file, save as, and then select the selected bodies. So the next thing I'm going to look at is quality versus quantity, essentially. I guess quality is a very high quantity. Quality versus file size is a good way to, to phrase it. So we're going to still be using this file here. A lot of people think that if you go file, save as, select it, STL, if you go, click on that options button, so if you select STL, you got the option button. People always think that if you ramp these all up, it's going to make a big difference. Quite realistically, is this is not. If you just stick with SolarWorks fine resolution, you're going to be fairly okay. And also what a lot of people do is like, oh, that file's quite big. I'm going to reduce it. And they ramp all of these down to the bottom and think it's going to be okay. It actually affects the model quite a bit. So I'll open up Chit2 box again. Because I've, I've saved these files already. Um, so this is our standard res file. This file is 100 kilobytes. Our high res file, which took about 10 minutes to save earlier today, that is about 7,600 kilobytes. Ignore the scale on it. Um, but you can see the surface is much smoother than that. There's quite a few little facets on there, but it's much smoother, which means there's a lot more triangles producing this face. But then let's bring in our low res version, which is this one here. You can see these faces are much bigger. And this file here is 80 kilobytes. So we've got 80, 100, and 7,600. Realistically, the difference between these two files, you're not going to really notice the difference in the 3D print. Um, maybe in resin, you'll see these little faces, which you can ramp up just a little bit. But realistically, SolidWorks Fine is perfectly fine. Um, you're going to come out with files that are absolutely beautiful. And you don't need to waste time with files like these. Very often at work, we get files that are just way too massive, and they're just a square. Um, so keep in mind on that. You know, Have a form of STL viewer or, or a, a 3D slicer and have a look at the quality of your files. If you feel like mm, maybe you do want to ramp it up, you can ramp it up if you want to, but you don't always need to. More isn't always better. And then the last thing I just want to show you guys is importing an STL. I'm sure many of you who have worked with SolidWorks know that SolidWorks hates STLs. But that's okay. It's not because it, it hates it. It's just... SolarWorks struggles to process an STL, especially a very, very high quality STL, one with thousands and thousands and thousands of triangles. So if we go File, Open, and we're going to open our normal res file. If we change this to 3D mesh files or mesh files, that includes your STLs, your OBJs, and various different kind of 3D files. That will show just purely them, and it will also give you the options button. So we'll click on uh, normal res, and we'll go to options. This will then give you your STL, OBJ, and so on options. So you've got three options, graphics body, surface body, or solid body. So we'll open it up as a graphics body. Quite often when you open up a SolidWorks file and I can't read it, it's going to open it up as a graphics body. What this means is that if we try to create a on this plane we'll just put a little circle going through the part it's not going to actually fuse to the model same thing you can't click on any faces to extrude off of it just means that this block here is just a reference that's very good for 3d scanning so if you had this as a 3d scan um, and you brought that in you can then start building around it um, to then start creating your model for yourself. You know, and start shaping it to mimic what that STL is. 
but let's bring it in as a solid body. I know this one will work because it was saved in SolidWorks. Um, but if we go to 3D Mesh, Normal Res Options, we're going to switch this to a solid body. And we'll bring this in. This will bring your body in as a solid body. As you can see there, solid bodies. We can actually sketch straight onto the surface. Let's bring this little box out. That actually fuses with that as well. That becomes one part of the body. So you can import STLs. You just got to be careful of the, the size and the, the, the quality of it. Because um, that will you know, allow SolarWorks to struggle with it. If, if you can bring it in um, and work on it, um, that's how you can import it as a solid body. SolarWorks is defaulted to a, a graphics body. Um, but you can bring in an STL into SolidWorks. Back to the presentation. Don't forget that time. But that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, there's some spicy memes if you like them. Everybody loves a good SolidWorks meme. I'll just hide my face so you can get that top one there. Thank you very much for, for, for watching this. I really hope you everybody had learned everything learned anything from it um, there's my email address down in the bottom right if you do wish to contact me and you have any questions please fire away let me know um, and I'll be and I'll help you out as best I can and if not I'm sure I can find someone who will have the answer for for me so what is next if you really liked this this presentation you know uncut presentation um you can see them all the time at SolarWorks user group uh that are all around the world as you can see there's a lovely map over there all the different locations around the world and if there isn't one in your location around the world go to swag swagon.org and you can apply for your own user group um they're very good to learn things like these and network with people and and chat about things like these um i run the london SolarWorks user group um so if you are in the London area, you'll be able to find a link to my group on swagon.org or on Meetup, so come check it out. But thank you very much for watching my presentation. I hope I didn't mess up too much. A couple of little mistakes, but you know what? It's fun. We're all having a good time. you know. And a, a big, big shout-out to the guys who've organized Slug Me 6. It's a big task they've been putting together. And thank you very much for inviting me to present on 3D printing for this Um 3D printing is very passionate. I'm very passionate about 3D printing and I like to talk about it a lot and I'm rambling as usual. Back to my face. Again, thank you very much for watching and hopefully I'll see you guys soon at my own user group or hopefully we'll see some awesome new user groups opening up and popping up around the world. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Slug Me 6.